the print soft cover. Today, we are joined by Sandeep Vasekar, and we are going to be discussing his book, A World Without War, The History, Politics, and Resolution of Conflict. Here is the book. Now we brief look at it. Gumby. That's great. Um, so Sandeep Vasekar is the founder of the international think tank, Strategic Foresight Group. He is also a senior research fellow at the Center for the Resolution of Intractable Conflicts at the University of Oxford. Uh, Vasekar is also a practitioner of track to diplomacy and since the 1990s has mediated in conflicts in South Asia and also those between Western and Islamic countries. These have related to deconstructing terror, water conflicts, and so on. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Sushant. Um, so I, I briefly, uh, I, I recently read the book and um, the thoughts that came to me were that with, with sort of meticulous research and analysis, a world without war examines the history and politics of war and offers solutions for achieving world peace by ending the escalating arms race between countries. Uh, significantly, the book also highlights the stark dangers which are imminent to the very survival of humanity with the range and scope of uh, destructible weapons available today, including nuclear weapons. Uh, in the book, Vasekar moves from just examining the roots of war to suggest there is a need for a new global social contract and security architecture to achieve sustainable long-term peace. Uh, the book argues that at the end, the choice for war is a decision up to people and decision makers, and it must be avoided at all costs. Um, so I, I'd like to begin by uh, asking you that there are multiple arguments and nuanced themes within the book. Uh, for our viewers, could you just unpack the central theme or argument for them? Thank you, Suchet, and uh, thank you for inviting me to the soft, co soft cover. It's a, it's a great pleasure. Um, well, we are living as a humanity in probably the most dangerous period since the birth of Homo sapiens uh, 200,000 years ago. And uh, this is because not only the answer is involving weapons of mass destruction is spiraling, but also because we are increasingly handing over control over weapons of mass destruction, particularly nuclear weapons, to advanced technologies like artificial intelligence and cyber technology. So we are entering an era where human beings and military commanders will be less in control of nuclear weapons. And algorithms and machines will be more in control. And this can spark a world war either by accident or by incident or by intent. And once we realize that we are very close to a precipice, we must take steps to move away uh, from the precipice. And we should not only aim to save the civilization from a potential war, a global war, but we must also make sure that humanity progresses in uh, in a very positive direction, that we have a new global social contract, we have a better understanding of the relationship between the individual and the human civilization. And that is the argument of the book. Okay, so uh, essentially, you're stating that not only the presence of say mass weapons of mass destructions, but however, their command and control, just on say algorithms and tech can pose a devastating future. Is that essentially it? Well, that is that is one part of it. One part. But the second part is that we must also find a way out of it. So before we move ahead on the way out and the sort of the social contract and everything that you talk about, uh, I'd like to just go to the beginning of the book uh, where you talk about the the town of Khan in France and where which was um, where the Hundred Years War took place between England and France and also the Battle of Normandy. It's it's been a place of excessive warfare and conflict. And then you juxtapose that image with the global uh, peace manifesto, which you are a signatory of over there. Uh, 
um which is in the abbey of the town is is that where it is yes exactly exactly um so i i'd like to ask if um, what what purpose does this sort of contrast or imagery serve in the book well uh, suchit i got the idea about the book at caen yeah. uh caen is the capital of normandy and uh, you know that normandy has a very important uh, place in the history of the second world war uh, yeah. the normandy landings and all that so uh, in 2019 i gathered a group of nobel peace laureates at com and we issued a, a normandy manifesto for world peace and while negotiating the manifesto with a group of nobel laureates and they included mohammad el bardai jody williams uh, 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 then there was also philosopher uh, uh, ac grayling uh, and uh, lema gobi nobel peace laureate uh, dennis mukwege nobel peace laureate so this is a group of philosophers and nobel peace laureates and well while negotiating the the normandy manifesto for world peace i realized that humanity is really facing existential crisis that uh, currently there are nine countries which have nuclear weapons but in a uh, few years from now or in a decade or so there could be uh, 15 or 18 countries having nuclear weapons and once that happens the non proliferation regime is totally in tatters and so we thought in normandy that uh, we must draw world's attention to the crisis of survival that human civilization is facing and we must also start preparing for a blueprint for the survival of human civilization and for the prosperity of of our species so while preparing the manifesto and while launching the the manifesto for world peace at com uh, se- several of my friends and colleagues suggested that uh, that one manifesto one manifesto was was a really good idea uh, but i should really elaborate these thoughts into a longer essay or a book and that is where the idea of the of the book was born so um basically god didn't only serve as the manifesto you know bringing the manifesto to guide but also was basically the idea of the book and that's that's why it's so central to it um all right now just moving ahead from there i, I would like to ask you uh specifically what is a word without war guy right? what could you talk about the idea of the social contract and global security architecture you mentioned in one of the chapters and you also you to emmanuel kant's perpetual peace and gandhi's idea of federation of democracies if you could unpack that for us well first of all we must realize that the world survived the cold war not by a fluke lot of people you know think that we survived the cold war because of fluke that there could have been a armageddon and uh, the world would have been uh, devastated but it was just by chance that we survived that was not the case that a number of uh, uh individuals a uh, number of uh, movements and 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 some of the leaders they made very active efforts to uh, to prevent a nuclear war during the cold war uh, there were uh, russian uh, military officers uh, uh, who could have pressed the button but they decided that uh, that there was a risk of an accidental nuclear war so they they stopped that uh there was a freeze movement in the united states there was a pressure on reagan and gorbachev from peace movements in those countries and they decided to cut down the stockpile of nuclear armament from the uh, uh, almost like 60000 in uh, 1980s to 10000 now which itself is quite dangerous so one lesson from this experience is that to create a world without war you need an active effort by citizenry by individuals by movements and by leaders to envision a a, a world where there is no place for uh, resolving conflicts uh, uh, through military confrontation but through negotiations now there are 20 countries in the world such as who have decided not to have armies or not to have armaments so these 20 countries are not worried about uh, their security uh, uh, one of them is panama Panama has a very strategic Panama Canal, and even then, Panama doesn't have an army or armament. Costa Rica next door doesn't have army or armament. Switzerland has army, but it's very, very minimalist use of army and armament in 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 Switzerland. And there are more than twenty, twenty, almost twenty-five countries which can live. Uh, there are one hundred and twenty-two countries 
uh, uh, which signed the treaty or the resolution in the UN uh, endorsing the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So out of 193 countries, uh, um, uh, 122 countries have decided that they don't want to have nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, out of 193 countries, uh, uh, 30 countries have decided or 25 countries have decided they don't want to have weapons at all of any kind. And out of 193 countries, almost 170 countries have a military expenditure of less than $1 billion. So the total military expenditure of $2 trillion uh, in the world, it's uh, uh, a substantial part of it is, is, is accounted for by the military expenses of only, only about uh, 12 to 15 countries or maybe 20 countries. Uh, so this shows that... Uh, that a vast majority of the countries do not want a war. They do not even want devastating weapons. Uh, but there are countries which, which want uh, uh, to engage in arms race. So if some countries can, can end the arms race and can be out of this big geopolitical game, if that is the wisdom that is understood by the other countries, it is possible to uh, mitigate the risk of a warfare, not eliminate it overnight. It is possible to reduce the military expenditure and eventually pave the way uh, for a world where problems are solved through negotiations and not through warfare. But, but, but I must ask you here then, say uh, more countries do adopt this stance. Uh, what do you think will happen to the very powerful uh, military industrial complexes and lobbies across the world who are the only ones who profit from warfare and conflict? Well, that is precisely the problem. I mean, this military industrial complex uh, 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 all over the world, but particularly in the three big countries, uh, uh, US, uh, Russia, and China, that is really pushing for a, for a framework of a world which is based on warfare. That is the root of the problem. I mean, you put your finger right on the, on the spot. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but common people have to realize this. Remember in the 1980s, they were pressing for uh, a nuclear arms race and you had 60,000 weapons. But Randy Falsberg, who was a young woman with no power and no charisma, launched the freeze movement in the United States and faced the military industrial complex of the US, such a powerful uh, uh, organization or a phenomenon, and managed to convince President Reagan to enter into an agreement with President uh, Gorbachev uh, to reduce the weapons of mass destruction in a phased manner. Well, in fact, Reagan start. and Gorbachev at one stage thought of... That, that was start, weapons. right? That was start, the beginning of start? The strategic uh, before armament. the beginning of start. Okay. Before, yeah, yeah but, but, but start was part of it. INF, Intermediate uh, Nuclear Force, uh, Forces uh, Treaty was another part of it. So there was a whole regime of various arms control treaties, which were signed by, by Gorbachev with Reagan to start with. And then with the uh, President Bush, who succeeded uh, uh, Reagan. And then the successive leaders took it. So throughout the 90s, there were a number of arms control agreements which were negotiated, which eliminated certain kinds of nuclear weapons altogether. But all this was done by the people's movement. Uh, and, and, and this movement could, could face or could counter the strength of the military industrial complex. So military industrial complex is not going to allow to create a world without war. And it's not only military industrial complex, it's also hyper-nationalism in these three big countries. Uh, the, you notice it most prominently currently in Russia. It was just going to be my follow-up question to you, but, but, but just before we go there, uh, if I could just, uh, just sum this up. So essentially what you're saying is that a new social contract has to come where people and citizens and advocacy groups vociferously talk about reducing arms and no warfare. And then that sort of creates a new architecture where states cut down on arms and armaments and that sort of ends this security dilemma in arms race. Is that essentially the main point? Uh, but more, more fundamentally at the philosophical level, yeah. we have to think of a global social contract. See, social contract was conceived and presented by, by Rousseau in 1762. Now in 1762, he thought of social contract in the context of Geneva city where he was, he was living and working. And so he thought of a relationship between the state and the society in the context of a country or in the context of a city-state, uh, which was very natural in the 18th century. Uh, 
and in the 19th century for that matter or even in the 20th century but now in the 21st century uh, you can't think in terms of nations alone uh, because the world has got globalized uh, with uh, various kinds of forces uh, from technology and communication to culture and 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 a uh, lot of other things and uh, so you cannot think purely in terms of a social contract which is applicable to a country but not to the world so the uh, social contract defined by by rousseau was about the relationship between state and the society now we have to have a have a, a social contract which is uh, defining a relationship between the uh, between the world that is the human civilization and the state and the society and that is the philosophical change uh, that has to take place and once this philosophical change uh, takes place then it has to be reflected in the reorganizing of institutional architecture of the united nations and and uh, other multilateral organizations okay i think uh, that's quite an interesting point if if this idea of social contract changes not only limited to the state then i guess global security architectures could in theory at least um start to change uh, but you spoke about it earlier moving forward the centrality of nationalism hyper nationalism and sort of individual egos uh, controlling a lot of state uh, policy and where does that fit in with your world without war well first of all weapons do not start a war it's men do you can say men and women do but it's mostly men who do start a war and is the men who are decision makers uh, who decide to develop weapons and use them and launch them to uh, engage in military confrontation with their adversaries now where do the men and in some cases women get their motivation to to get into warfare and here nationalism plays an important role until about 16th or 17th century religion was the basis of many of the wars particularly in europe but also in middle east and in in other parts of the world now this is changing in 1648 the uh, peace of westphalia was signed the idea of a nation came into being and since then slowly the idea of nation has gathered strength initially the idea of nation was very positive it was to mobilize different factions different groups different tribes within a certain territory into a common bond uh, this idea of nation was also very positive to uh, uh, to challenge colonization and to uh, launch struggles of independence it started in latin america in asia it happened in the uh, 20th century india became independent in 1947 number of other uh for countries in asia and africa became independent in the 1950s and early 1960s and so nationalism worked as a positive force but the same nationalism can also work as a counterproductive force and so, so rabindranath tagore uh, albert einstein all these great people have uh, voiced their views about what nationalism should be if it is to do good to your fellow human being in your society it's a positive nationalism but if your idea of nationalism involves destroying other nationalities destroying other countries to prove your superiority it is destructive nationalism and that is what we are we are seeing today in order to reinforce one kind of nationalism you are attacking countries in your neighborhood and you are trying to destroy their kind of nationalism so nationalism plays an extremely important role the way religion played it few centuries ago okay i think uh, th- that's quite an important contrast that going back earlier conflict was all based on religion and now it's bearing into nationalism um so before we uh, conclude I- i'd like to ask you uh, that you know many scholars of international relations specifically those who could be defined as neo realists and realists would argue that nuclear weapons actually deter conflict they don't lead to conflict because the scales are so high uh, given that your book argues predominantly against this posture what are your thoughts to this statement and this sort of do- dominating ideology well the theory of de- deterrence basically says that uh, a country x 
will not attack country Y because it is worried that country Y will launch a very huge retaliatory attack on country X and destroy country X completely. That is a theory of deterrence. Yeah. And so it is believed that uh, that uh, the, uh, each country uh, therefore is worried about the retaliatory attack from its rival and therefore it doesn't want to use nuclear weapons in the first try. But this is changing a lot. With artificial intelligence, you can now detect mobile launchers, uh, launchers which provide the second strike capacity. You can detect uh, underwater unmanned vehicles which uh, provide second strike capacity. Uh, you can uh, 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 mix artificial intelligence with cyber technology and manipulate the early warning system, which can also have an impact on second strike capacity. So with the new technologies, your second strike capacity is getting redundant. And so therefore, uh, people, the countries, nations cannot anymore depend on their second strike capacity. So they have to uh, launch the first strike. So basically, uh, we are at a stage where the theory of deterrence is failing, uh, mostly because of technological developments, and there is no substitution for the theory of uh, deterrence. Uh, so the only alternative to deterrence is really disarmament. And that is my argument. So, uh, I think you summed it up fantastically that the only alternative to deterrence is disarmament. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Vasekar, for joining us. It's been truly a very insightful conversation. And I hope people engage with the book and the idea of a new global social contract, which creates a new security architecture to get rid of war. And just to show the book again, Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you, and it has been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me today.